Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please Go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for us. You can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. All right, it's the end of Thanksgiving week, weekend, however you want to frame it. Um, this will be kind of a rambling long intro. I have some, some good news and some bad news from half of my life ago. Um, both things came up in the past week. See, I studied in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, from 1993 to 95. I was around 22 to 24. And, um, we'll start with the bad news. That first summer, I lived with my pal, John, and a classmate of his, Mike. Uh, they had just finished the undergrad program in Annapolis, and I was just about to start the Graduate Institute at the at the school. Um, it was a fun summer, as I imagine summers always are when you're you're 22. Um, Mike and I were friendly, uh, but didn't really stay in touch after he left Annapolis that fall. Um, John was the oldest friend I had, but he stopped talking to me about 15 years ago, which is a whole other story. So last week, I um I got the college bulletin. I, I'm sitting down to read, looking up for people around my years. And, um, and I learned that Mike died a few months earlier, uh, that would make him like 45 or 46 years old. And, um, I went online to find out what I could, uh, about the circumstances. And I knew he'd been working at the Washington post. I knew he was in journalism back when we knew each other. Uh, I think he was going into the post back then, as a matter of fact. Um, but I hadn't heard or, or read about him in many, many years. Um, so I, I did some searching and I came across a, a Washington post pal of his, like a post college friend, uh, who'd written a blog post about Mike's death. Um, he'd shot himself. He'd taken a buyout from the Washington post a year or so before there was something about a divorce, losing custody of his kids. I, um, I felt awful. I, uh, I reached out to our, our friend John, despite our lack of contact, to see if he could tell me anything about Mike's death beyond what was there. And um, he didn't have any details. He mentioned another college pal who, who probably would. And I, I thought about getting in touch with that guy. And then I thought, you know, what more do I want to know? I mean, is there... Is there some level of detail that's, that's, you know, gonna mitigate things or, you know, make suicide explicable or, or excusable? Um, I mean, do I want to know the details of something that's, that's sad enough already? And how much, how much do all the details add up? I mean, how much can you really know about what's in someone's heart, um, when they make that decision? So I, I didn't contact the other guy. Um, Mike's gone. I don't, I haven't known him for 20 years. Um, now I think about how someone's life can go off the rails, I guess. So for the good news, um, on Saturday morning, I saw a news item about a triple homicide in Virginia. Um, it happened on Thanksgiving. I don't normally click through that sort of stuff, but for some reason this time I did. 
It was a husband who killed his wife, his stepdaughter, and her boyfriend. Gun, of course, um, as I mentioned down in Virginia. The thing was, the wife's first name and the stepdaughter's last name was really, really similar to that of a woman I knew back in Annapolis. She wasn't at, at the college. She was a bit older than me, actually. Uh, she worked in the record store on Main Street, and she was just the coolest woman around. Um, we palled around a little, never romantically, just went out to movies and such. But I'd hang out in the record store, listen to Golden Palomino's records. Um, you know, it was, well, uh, someone I hadn't thought about in many, many years, much like Mike. So I frantically looked her up, trying to find her on Facebook first. Um, there were no pictures of the victims in the, the, the news story. Um, but eventually I found the person on Facebook who I'm pretty sure was the victim I saw her face and thought, I really don't remember her looking like that, but it's been 20 years. Um, I kept looking. I found someone who I was pretty sure was my old pal uh, with a married name now, but she had the the um, her maiden name as her middle name. Anyway, that's, that's how I made the connection. She was living far away from Virginia. Um, I sent her a Facebook message, introducing myself, asking just... Um, did you used to work in a record store in Annapolis in the, the 1990s? And uh, without saying, because I'm worried that, y you know, you're dead in a triple homicide. Uh, she wrote back a day later and she said it was her and she was happy to hear from me. Um, I wrote back that I was glad it was her, partly so we could reconnect and partly because of this really macabre story this weekend. Uh, she said she'd heard about that story this morning and was creeped out by it, plus the coincidence of, of the names and all. Um, anyway, we had a nice exchange. We caught up a little. We're both in pretty happy places. I mean, you you guys think I'm happy, right? Anyway, uh, we're probably still listening to the music we were listening to in that record store back in, in 1994. I know I still break out my, my Palomino's records all the time. Um, so that's the good news. And that makes up a little for all the bad stuff. But sometimes you can kind of reach back in time and, and things aren't too late, you know? Anyway, I would say enough with all the, the tabloid wackiness. Um, but our guest this week actually dives into tabloid wackiness. See, his name's Eddie Portnoy, and his new book is called Bad Rabbi and Other Strange But True Tales from the Yiddish Press. It's published by Stanford University Press. And in it, Eddie collects stories from Yiddish newspapers from Poland and New York from like the 1880s to the 1930s or so. It, just diving into the, the seedy, wacky underworld of, of Jewish culture. It is, it is uproariously entertaining. Uh, there are just crazy stories about, about bigamist rabbis, uh, 600 pound Jewish wrestlers, Hatfield and McCoy like rivalries between religious sects, um, a, Jewish beauty contest in Warsaw. It's, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, all sorts of crime and, and seediness and, and misbegotten behavior that my people, you know, we tend not to get associated with nowadays. So as you could tell, I enjoyed the living hell out of Bad Rabbi. Uh, Drew Friedman was the guy who connected me and Eddie. He suggested we get together. And of course, a book like this is right up his alley too. Um, in fact, I, I actually recommended it to a few past guests, uh, some of whom have already bought their copies of it. Um, it's just a goddamn delight, frankly. Uh, it's filled with pictures from the, the Yiddish papers, including like cartoons that commented on the stories uh, to give you an idea of how the pop culture was interpreting these these crazy tabloid tales, um, but doing it all within the, the Jewish subcultures of these these cities. It's I guess it's just fun to see what tabloid culture was like in those places and, and those eras. Also, it's good to remember, no matter how much we're considered the people of the book, life can go off the rails for, for Jews also. We're not all, um, I think as Eddie says, we're not all smart. There are a lot of dummies in our past. Um, anyway, Bad Rabbi from Stan Stanford University Press, author is Eddie Portnoy. Now, the only caveat I've got here is the uh, police siren that comes up about a half hour into the conversation. It got stuck outside the building. It, it, it was insane. Um, I just couldn't sample it out without really screwing up the audio for that segment. So you'll have to bear with it. Now, here's Eddie's bio. 
An expert on Jewish popular culture, Eddie Portnoy has an M.A. in Yiddish from Columbia and a Ph.D. in Jewish history from the Jewish Theological Seminary. He currently serves as academic advisor for the Max Weinreich Center and exhibition curator at the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. The exhibitions he has created for YIVO have won plaudits from the New York Times, Vice, The Forward, and others. Oh, also, he looks like Getty Lee. I swear to God. Just go to the show notes. You'll see the picture. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Eddie Portnoy. Did you think about what your poor mother was going to think when you put this book out? Actually, one of the interesting things is that, uh, in a way, this was written with her in mind. Yeah. Not the not the content, but the way it was written. So I originally wrote this for trade, and uh, I couldn't really find someone who was interested. So I went with University Press, mm -hmm. and the reason was because when I wrote my first academic article, I was so proud. I you know, bought an extra copy of the journal for like $50 and I sent it to my mother and she looked at it and she called me back and she said, you know what? I can't even read this. <laughs> I don't understand this language. Academic jargon heavy. Exactly. Okay. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't even that jargon heavy, but it was to it you, to me. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, in a way I wanted something that, you know, my mother could, could read and, mm. and enjoy. And, uh, the stories, you know, while they're not, uh, you know, they don't show people in the best of lights. They are. I think it's a readable book. Yeah, so very much. It's 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 a very entertaining tabloid, uh, <laughs> you know, reading of of Yiddish population, Warsaw and and New York. Uh, I know you talk about it in the 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 outro of the book, but can you talk a little about how it began, what the genesis of the book was for you? Sure. Uh, there are a number of there are a number of uh, of ways that I got to this material. Almost all of them entirely by accident. Mm. So uh, my dissertation was on cartoons of the Yiddish press, and I found a number of themes and topics just by way of researching cartoons. So just as an example, I was looking at the Warsaw Yiddish press for cartoons, and I was about the mid-1920s, and I began to come across cartoons uh, that used wrestling as a metaphor. Like it would show two cantors who were vying for an important post in the wrestling ring or two heads of Yiddish school system systems in the wrestling ring. And I thought, okay, that's, you know, a stock metaphor, but you know, what do, what do Jews in Warsaw in the 1920s know about professional wrestling or wrestling at all? And so it kind of piqued my interest, like why they would use this. So I began to look in the back pages of the papers where they listed the, the results of sporting events. And sure enough, I began to find the results of wrestling matches. And as I read them more and more, I began to find that they would mention, you know, Perlmutter, the Jewish wrestler, you know, lost to so-and-so. Or, you know, they, they would begin to talk about the Jewish wrestlers. And occasionally I stumbled across, you know, more extensive articles about Jews and professional wrestling in Warsaw. And I became really fascinated with this, this, you know, this whole idea that, uh, I mean, first of all, there are all kinds of preconceived ideas that people have about, you know, what Eastern European Jewish culture is, you know, what Yiddish culture is. And typically, professional wrestling doesn't fall within that category. That's, that's not what anyone ever thinks of. So as I collected more and more information about this, I began to find that not only was it uh, extremely popular among you know, urban Jews of, of interwar Poland, uh, but it was also po extremely popular among Hasidim. And this struck me as, as even more interesting. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I discovered was that uh, Hasidim would go to matches and when the Jewish wrestler was in trouble, uh, they would all stand up and sing psalms. <laughs> so there's this, you know, there's yeah. really, I mean, being an audience member at a wrestling match is not like being an audience member at a play or a film or anything like that. You're 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 part of there's there's sort of an audience you're part of an audience performer equation that that doesn't really exist in a lot of places. So uh, you know the, the, this is a very Jewish form of viewing. You know if you get up and sing psalms and you know in the in the middle of a match, mm -hmm. and they had you know numerous Jewish wrestlers. Uh, there was you know some of them would go and uh, perform with Yiddish. You know, with the Yiddish theater people, uh, they were very active in the community, uh, and P they were celebrities. 
and they were completely unknown to history. And I don't tell my dis- dissertation advisor this, but I took a semester off of dissertation research just to research Jews and professional wrestling. And another thing I found was that um, Jews in Poland were connected to wrestling in America because there was a uh, a guy from Warsaw whose name was Jack Pfeffer, who was a wrestling impresario, who uh, maintained – he was from Warsaw, but he lived and worked in America. And he would take trips back to Eastern Europe and to Asia to uh, bring uh, what he called freakish wrestlers into – the field. And what's interesting is this guy, Pfeffer, who began work in wrestling in the 1920s in New York, uh, was the first person to introduce freaks into wrestling. Like mm-hmm. he would make his wrestlers shave their heads, grow, you know, huge handlebar mustaches. Uh, you know, d- he was the first person who brought the Swedish angel to America. I mean, I don't know if you know these, these, um, oh, from reading the book. Yeah. Oh, from reading yeah. the book. Okay. Yeah. So he, the Swedish angels, like a famously ugly yeah. character. He was, you know, he obviously brought Blimp Levy, this, you know, 625 pound Jewish wrestler into the fold. And so, uh, he was this link between, uh, wrestlers in Eastern Europe and, and wrestlers in America. And he had all of these, you know, in the United States, he had all these ethnic stables. He had, you know, a stable of Greek wrestlers, of, of Italian wrestlers, of Jewish wrestlers. And this this was sort of how, you know, before, let's say the 1950s, wrestling was very much based on, on ethnic affiliation. Mm -hmm. And so because you had significant, uh, Jewish communities or Jer- Jewish urban communities uh, who were very much working class, they uh, took interest in sort of working class entertainment pursuits. And this meant rus- wrestling. Mm-hmm. So they would go to see wrestling matches. Uh, they would go to see boxing matches. They were – Jews were obsessed with boxing, you know, in uh, in the, you know, teens, 20s, 30s. This is obviously also the heyday of Jewish boxers. Uh, so uh, it, it brought in this aspect to Jewish history that people – no one really uh, – no one really had touched, and I, I found it so appealing, and I really found it all through cartoons. There are other chapters in the book that uh, I I'm also – They're a gateway drug, but go on. They yeah. are. It, it's, 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 it's – I mean I would say it's a problem, but I guess it's a, <laughs> it's a good problem. Cartoons are a good problem. Mm-hmm. So uh, another one of the uh, chapters is uh, about this Jewish beauty pageant that takes place in Poland in 1929. It's called the Miss Judea pageant for the most – Beautiful Jewish girl in Poland. You could say Jewess. It's just us. Jewess, so, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was looking, you know, I was doing dissertation research, and I, in in the spring of 1929, I began finding cartoons, multiple, numerous cartoons of a particular woman, uh, always with cleavage and a unibrow. You know, she was kind of like this Jewish Frida Kahlo type. And I, when I first saw the cartoons, I had no idea who it was, and when you're researching cartoons in a foreign language uh, in a foreign country and you have no idea who the person is, you have to begin reading the daily pre- – you have to do research. You, you mm-hmm. have to begin reading the daily press to figure out who these characters are and what the story is behind them. Sometimes this would happen and it would go nowhere. But as I began to research this particular figure, I discovered that she was – uh, the central figure in a huge scandal that took place in uh, in March and April of 1929 in Warsaw that was another episode that historians had never heard about and you know never took interest in and obviously you know historians tend to move toward you know the figures, great man yeah figure, you know. figures of significance the, mm-hmm. you know the, the the great man and in, in Jewish history in particular it's rabbis scholars mm-hmm. politicians artists writers the, these kinds of things uh you know the the you know the trope of the common man is important and so there's this whole social history but uh it doesn't really have to do with with things like this so uh this story turned out to be they uh there was this beauty pageant run by the Polish language Jewish newspaper which was called Nash Pseglon, which is our review. And they it was really just a publicity stunt. You know, most beautiful Jewish girl in Poland, most beautiful Jewess in Poland. And they hold this uh, pageant. A woman by the name of Sophia, uh, Sophia Oldock wins, and she's carted around town by the editors of the paper to all the local political figures, uh, you know, important writers, artists, you know, any any local celebrity, Yiddish theater people, 
any celebrities they can find, they go for, for photo ops. The photos are printed in the paper. They happen to uh, organize a banquet for her at what was called the, the Warsaw Kahila, which is the Jewish Community Council. Now, Jewish communities in the United States have these things called JCCs. That's not at all what this is. The Jewish Community Councils in Poland were uh, elected bodies that Jews paid taxes to, and these councils arranged for Jewish schools, uh, the administration of cemeteries, uh, Jewish property, old age homes, all kinds of th things like that uh, for the Jewish community where the Polish government wasn't willing to to step in and, hmm. and, and arrange things for them. So it was sort of like a quasi-governmental uh, agency for the Jewish community in, in Poland. So they arranged for this banquet for Miss Judea at the um, – at the Kahila, at the Warsaw Community Council, and at which the president of the Kahila, uh, sort of the elder statesman of a Zionist political party, a religious Zionist political party called Mizrahi, stands up, praises Sophia Oldock's beauty, and sings her Song of Songs, which is this sort of erotic yeah. poem from the Bible. <laughs> and... You know, everything goes fine, except for the next day, the ultra-Orthodox political parties find out about it, and they go berserk. And they immediately bring all of their kids out of their yeshivas, which incidentally is something they still do today in Israel. Uh, but they bring all of their kids out of the yeshivas to protest in front of the Jewish Community Council building. The um, The newspaper, the secular newspaper that organized it, arranged for counter-protesters, secular protesters to protest on the other side of the street. Uh, so on the one side of the street, you have ultra-Orthodox Jews. On the other side of the street, you have secular Jews. And in the middle, you have Polish policemen who just have no idea what's happening and don't, yeah. and, and don't understand this. And they're just sort of stuck between this, you know, stuck in this weird Jewish fight. Uh, after a few weeks, this episode kind of dies down. Uh, and, the, you know, Jews in Yiddish-speaking Jews in Poland and elsewhere were easily, you know, thrown into convulsions over the smallest, uh, the smallest perceived slights, and this was this was an instance of that. Uh, but about uh, a few weeks after this happened, the president of the ultra-Orthodox political party died. Unrelated to any of this, he was old and he he passed away. So the president of the community council still has to give a eulogy at his funeral. And his funeral is one of these gigantic Hasidic funerals with, you know, 20,000 mourners. So he gets up there to give a eulogy and suddenly people are shouting him down because they remember from, a you know, the Miss Judea episode from a few weeks earlier. And he realizes that this isn't going to work and he gets hustled out of there. But the crowd won't calm down. You have all these younger kids who were brought out to protest. They start screaming. They start fighting. Uh, a riot breaks out in the cemetery, and because this funeral was uh, taking place at the end of the day, you can't bury a, 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 after a body sundown. after sundown. Yeah. They began lowering the body as uh, people were screaming and fighting around Throwing the grave. Throwing yeah. yeah, it was. It was. You know, it was like a wrestling match. <laughs> yeah, tying back every, to wrestling. Every, everything <laughs> goes back to wrestling. That's 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 the that's one of the keys. So uh, this is just another instance of cartoons. You know, just feeding back to a story right, that right. turns out to be, yeah, right. Just you know, being a conduit into the you know a whole weird world of scandal, and uh, you know, I think you, you could you know you could feasibly do this with cartoons of any culture mm -hmm. in any time and place. You'd be able to find all kinds of you know fascinating little details about uh, about events that you know people have have completely forgotten. Mm -hmm. What was your background with the? Um We'll say lower class Jews. The idea that there were, you know, Jewish criminals and and just a whole declass A right. well, world. Because I, mean, I assume you had a suburban Jewish upbringing like me. Yeah, somewhere, I did. So. I, I I did. And it's, um, you know, everyone knew that there were, you know, that there were Jewish criminals. That that this, you know, that this type of phenomenon exists. And, you know, one of the things is that people, you know, you'll read about it in literature. Like if you read Isaac Babel sure. or Basheva Singer. Uh, or, you know, Karpanovich. There are, all, there are lots of Yiddish writers and lots of other writers, you know, have written about Jewish criminals. It's, it's not unknown. But that's literature. So literature is very different than, you know, than reading newspapers. Yeah. Uh, you know, in literature, it, you know, there's, you know, they wax poetic. They're, you know, it, it's, it's almost like a fantasy. Uh, the reality was that 
these people were very real. And if you read the Yiddish dailies from the early 20th century, there are phenomenal stories. I mean, they're not, obviously they're not, most of them are not rendered in a literary fashion. They're both mundane and sensational. Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, you know, you have reporters who are on deadline who are, you know, writing up these stories, you know, for really informational purposes. And many of them are absolutely phenomenal. You, you find all kinds of information, just that the nicknames alone are just, yeah. are just amazing. <laughs> yeah. How tough was it? Um, well, having collections of this stuff, how tough was it you know, to, to find, and I assume through the resources you have here, how complete are the collections, I guess, of the, the Yiddish papers? Well, the Yiddish pa you have most of the Yiddish papers in, especially here. I mean, I look, I looked at most of them on microfilm, mm -hmm. you know, in the years since then, uh, there's a project at the National Library of Israel to digitize these newspapers and uh they've you know they're they obviously obviously have much less online than there is available here on microfilm but it you know i can sit in bed and you know read old yiddish newspapers yeah i guess the question is who is preserving the polish um yiddish papers given you know what the 30s and 40s meant for Jews right and Poland? right of course so the there a lot of these are in a variety of places so for instance uh the new york public library has a very significant collection of um of yiddish newspapers mostly really from the united states but mm -hmm. also some from poland uh the national library of israel has a very significant collection now yivo where i work uh probably has the biggest collection and the reason is because yivo began collecting in 1925 and they they for a variety of reasons they became they, they came into possession of their pre-war collection it's a long story. I don't know if you want to hear it. Maybe you don't. Well, yeah, if you have a truncated version of it. It's one of the things that just fascinated me. Right. The fact that given how Jewish population got annihilated in, in right. Poland, that someone actually kept all these, these newspapers right. somewhere. So, for instance, yeah. libraries in Poland, you know, they collected this stuff. Mm -hmm. So they still they, – uh, there, are, there are a number of libraries like there's uh, – the, the Jewish Historical Institute in Poland – has a a, very, a pretty significant collection of, of Yiddish newspapers. Uh, but Yivo, for example, uh, like I said, they started collecting in 1925, and they amassed an enormous collection through the second half of the 20s and the 1930s. It, it became kind of a library of Congress of the Jews, uh, not just for books, but for all kinds of archival material. And during World War II, portions of their collection were hidden in the Vilna ghetto uh, and uh, in a variety, in, in, in a couple of other places, and then unearthed after the war. Some of it was also sent uh, to Germany by the Nazis. And this is a, an unusual episode where uh, uh, a group of Nazis arrived in Vilna with lists of libraries uh, because they wanted uh, specific Jewish books and manuscripts. Hmm. The reason being is they wanted to. They were. They were. They had created an institute called the um, – it was the Institute for Research on the Jewish Question. It was basically a, a, an institute to research Jews without them. And so they were collecting materials related to Jewish life and culture, most, mostly rabbinical materials, but other, other stuff as well. So they arrived in Vilna knowing that Vilna was a center for Jewish libraries – and, uh, you know, you had the YIVO building. You also had something called the Strashun Library, which was the Jewish public library, which had a very significant collection. And these, uh, when, they, when they arrived in Vilna in June 1941, they uh, plundered these, these libraries. And coincidentally, they took over the YIVO building in order to use it as a collecting point for these materials they were stealing. And they brought Jews from the ghetto uh, in a slave labor brigade to sort and catalog the material and pack them up and send them to Germany. Yeah. So some of these Jews said, we need to save our rare YIVO materials. The Germans are going to destroy it. So we need to sneak it in with these packages going to Germany with these, you know, they had enormous crates. Uh, we need to sneak it in with these, into these crates going to Germany. You know, we may not survive the war, but the Germans won't win and someone will find this after the war and they'll know what to do with it. So they did that. Another group among these workers said, we need to say, you know, we need to save these materials. What we're going to do is we're going to smuggle them back into the ghetto, bury them there, and we'll return after the war and dig them up. And okay. that's what they also did. Raiders of the Lost Tabloid sort of thing? Basically. Okay. Well, it was, I mean, it, most, of the, most of this was sort of more rare materials, mm -hmm. but some newspapers did survive as well. And uh, they... 
Uh, th this one group came back after the war. They dug up their materials in the Vilna ghetto. And when they realized the Soviets – and Vilna was now in the Soviet Union. It's now Vilnius. That when they realized that the Soviets weren't interested in any kind of Jewish institution that would house these materials, they, they arranged for – to smuggle it, to have it smuggled back to the West and to Yivo's office in New York. Yivo had always have, had an office in New York since the 1930s. And in 1940, the New York office became the main office. So people began sending materials there. So uh, they arranged for to smuggle the materials out of Vilna, through Poland, through Western Europe, and then finally to New York. Uh, the material that wound up in Germany uh, was discovered by the Monuments Men by this division yeah. of the U.S. Army Monuments, Fine Arts, and Artifacts. And they uh, they arranged for YIVO in New York to to receive the material because the Cold War was already on. They didn't know what the Soviets would do with it. Also, 95% of Vilna's Jews had been murdered, and YIVO is the only surviving Jewish organization uh, from that city. So since it was now in New York, it made sense to, to send it to YIVO in New York. So as a result, and it's really kind of a miracle that YIVO has this really enormous – portion of its pre-war archive. Even more crazy, in the uh, late 1980s, as the Soviet Union was began to collapse, uh, it turned out that a Lithuanian librarian had also hidden a huge cache of YIVO material in, uh, in a church in Vilna. Uh, and these materials uh, were, you know, unearthed in the late 1980s, and there's a huge project to uh, digitize and and sort of reunite all of it online, um, and even more nuts is in May they discovered another cache of this material in yeah. in the National Library in Lithuania of like 170 thousand documents. So it's you know it's just Give amazing. For a sequel. That, that's good. Yeah, it's 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 just amazing <laughs> that this that this exists. But that sort of you know, I, like I said, I couldn't I couldn't give you a short version. No, of this no, story. that's that's a great story. Uh, <laughs> this is really the short version. It's yeah. uh, it's uh, crazy. How did you get started with Yiddish and I, with, with Yiddish cultural <clears throat> studies, but with studying the language first? Right. So my uh, grandparents were Yiddish speakers and they were always uh, speaking Yiddish to each other. Yiddish was my, – my father was born in Detroit, but Yiddish was his first language. He didn't speak English until he went to kindergarten and, uh, you know, when he was five. Uh, it was just the language of their house. And when I was a kid, I f somehow found, found this very appealing. Uh, my father always used to – like he grew up on a block where, you know, it was all immigrants and their families and – Jewish immigrants or just – Yes, yes. No, no. It was, oh, okay. it was like his – yeah. The, the area that he grew up in Detroit was all Jewish immigrants, all Yiddish speaking. Uh, you know, many of his friends spoke Yiddish and whenever he'd get, to get, get together with them, he, would, he and his friends would tell dirty jokes in Yiddish and they – laughed hysterically. I thought this was amazing as a kid and I wanted in on that. I thought that was, you know, who... Yeah. Secret code. Right. Yeah. So when I was... Um, uh, oh, incidentally, I should add that I hated Hebrew school. And I mean, I think that most kids do. Yeah. Or a yeah. lot of kids do. We, I, we, maybe some kids like it. I don't know. But I hated it and I couldn't wait for my bar mitzvah so I could just quit Hebrew school, which I immediately did of course. when I was 13. So, But right after that, I found myself going to my grandparents and becoming really interested in Yiddish and ask, walking around the house with them, you know, asking what things were, you know, like pointing to things on shelves and saying, you know, what's that? What's that? And I would walk around with a piece of paper and a pencil, you know, making these little lexicons of Yiddish words, just writing them out in, in you know, my Phonetic. own. Yeah, just phonetically mm -hmm. in my own form of transliteration. And my father, when I was in high school, bought me a book called Der Yiddish Lehrer, which is the Yiddish teacher. It's this little you know, this, this slim, slim little paperback on how to read and write Yiddish. While I was in high school, I taught myself to read and write Yiddish. Uh, it was just a weird hobby. I, so you didn't date much is what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> that was for other reasons, but... Uh, I think they all tie together. Yeah, they, they, may, they, they may tie together. But, you know, what's interesting is at the same time... So when I was in high school, I was, I was you know, up like a punk rock skater kid. I was really into underground comics. I sort of, I sort of had this normal teenage life. I mean, I don't know if it was that normal, but basically normal but, teenage but, life. Yeah, but a standard weirdo as yes. opposed to yeah. – Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. I was a yeah. standard freak. Um, but there was this other component where I was just like into Yiddish. And I you know, was always – you know, as I improved, I would speak with my grandparents, uh, with you know, with my, my other grandmother who also spoke some Yiddish. Uh, and 
I sort of maintained this when I, you know, all through college and no one, none of my friends were interested. They didn't, I didn't have any, but like it was something I really did on my own. And when I uh, moved to New York uh, a few years after college, I got a job at a small publishing company uh, that did mostly academic stuff. In fact, it did mostly, and this is, I don't know why there, this connection exists. It's a little, it's a little eerie, but they mostly publish things on microfilm. You know, my, my, my life and microfilm are, are intimately <laughs> intertwined in, in bizarre ways. So, uh, in fact, my, one of the first big projects I worked on was the Bascom collection of Yoruba books on microfilm. It's, you know, Yoruba is a West African language. Yeah. It was just a, a weird project that I did. But we wound up doing a project with YIVO uh, uh, to microfilm Lithuanian Yiddish newspapers. And I was put in charge because Yiddish was on my resume. So the boss said, you, you know, you'll you're do You're the this. one guy who can do this. Uh, you're right, exactly. Yeah. You, you know, you can do this. You're, you're in charge of this project. So I met with the chief librarian of YIVO uh, to talk about, you know, the arrangements for, for microfilming this, this material. And I told him about my interest in Yiddish, that I taught myself to read and write, that, you know, it had been this sort of family language of longstanding. And he said, oh, well, you know, we run this uh, intensive Yiddish summer program at Columbia uh, every summer. Uh, you might be really interested in that. And so I looked into that, took Yivo summer program and was hooked. I enrolled in grad school the next fall and... Again, like, gateway, you're hanging out with klezmer bands after hours. Right, yeah, yeah ba that's basically <laughs> it. And, uh, you know, I, like I tell a lot of people, I turned a really fun hobby into a low-paying career. <laughs> <laughs> but at least you didn't turn it into hardcore religious practice. That's, yes, that's true. So you know, that was really kind of never in the offing. I'm yeah. not, uh, you know, I don't go that way. Yeah. Was that either a push or a, but why wouldn't you? You've put all this time into to Well, you know, you know, there like I've encountered some people who say, um, and incidentally, I did my doctoral work. I have, a, I have a master's in Yiddish from Columbia, but I did my doctoral work at uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary. And as part of that, I had to take classes in Bible and Talmud and Midrash and all, you know, the sort of traditional you know, ways core, that Jews argue. Right. The, you know, the traditional core of Jewish texts. And, uh, you know, so these are things that I, you know, I have knowledge of. And so I will occasionally come across people who say, you know, you have all of these tools, you know, you're, you're letting them go to waste. Um, yeah. And to be honest, they're not going to waste because to – one of the interesting things, in fact, about Yiddish cartoons is that if you don't understand basic Jewish texts, you know, Bible, Talmud, mm -hmm. all this stuff, you cannot understand Yiddish cartoons because though that is their main form of metaphor. They they constantly refer to traditional Jewish texts and I, you know, I will, you know, come across, uh, you know, a cartoon with a caption that is very obviously – from the Talmud, and you know, but they're what they're doing is they're just taking a, a you know a phrase from the Talmud and they're applying it to some modern you know political or, or cultural thing. You know, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's just like culturally, that's how uh, how Yiddish cartoons work. I mean, obviously, a lot of them don't do this, but yeah. many of them. Do, like, but you have that as a common language for or a common you know framework for everybody. right, right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Huh. Your family's history? They came over a generation before everything went to hell. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so my my mom's family came over in the late nineteenth century. My dad's family came over just before and after World War One. Okay, I'm first generation American. So we we just right. ate shit in every direction. It was <laughs> <laughs> dad was thirty eight in Romania, mom was forty in London. So yeah, it was it was just right. We'll go meet in Israel and and yeah, came to America. You know, right. starting yeah, the suburbs, yeah, yeah. etc. You know, for for Jewish immigrants, for immigrants in general, there's a lot of shit eating. You know, yeah, for Jewish immigrants, it's kosher shit eating. Yeah, so that's that's something. Was the original Yivo Lower East Side, Garden no, District, so, or Diamond so, District? Right. What was it? No, you know, none, none of that. None really? of those. So when Evo first moved to the United States, or their office originally was – when they opened their office in the 1930s, was, it was on 123rd Street. Uh, I think it wasn't – Didn't mean what 123rd Street means nowadays. Well, or, it, it was yeah. 120, the 123rd Street, I think, between Broadway and Amsterdam. Yeah. And you know, really near the Jewish Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. And – Originally, it was really just an office. It was kind of a fundraising office. It, it, you know, and only at the beginning of World War I did it become Yivo's official office. And they began bringing things there. Uh, after the war, and I want to say it was in the 1950s. I'm not exactly sure. But they moved to an old Va Vanderbilt mansion on 86th and 5th, 
uh, which is now the uh, the Neue Gallery. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really an amazing building, um, but they sold it uh, and they moved here to the Center for Jewish History where they, uh, where they share space with uh, four other Jewish organizations, uh, none of whom really get along. Yeah. And nobody was that pushy in the elevator, so I figure, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Do you um you have issues about traveling to Europe, uh, uh, particularly to to you know um, countries that destroyed all their Jews? Yeah, I mean it's weird. Um, yeah. or, or it can be weird. Yeah. It's it, you know I did you have to justify anything to yourself in order to to make any of those trips? Not not really. I mean okay. I, I mean for me the interest was in a lot of ways academic, mm -hmm. or, or at least that's what I said to myself. I, I you know I study this material, so it's you I know to, to be in this this right. So it's, at, some, at some point I'm going to make my way to these places. Uh, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, for instance, Poland today. In fact, Poland this week is is frightening. Uh, you know, prior to this, and I know lots of you know Polish scholars, Polish people who you know are virulently opposed to what's going on, and it, you know. It's 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 uh, you know it's a really difficult situation for them, uh, but going to these places, you know, it depends where it is, and it depends what you see. You know, for instance, if you take I don't know, have you been to Poland? No, Germany, which I had to do some work to get over, but Thane Rosenbaum helped. Right, uh, Thane right. explained it. You know, Germany is not the issue. It's places like Poland and Lithuania where they pretend there never were any Jews. That's that's where things are more problem. And that's that's a thing perspective. Yeah, no, that made that um, that that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it, it definitely makes sense. I mean, Germany for me is weird. I you know I haven't been there for a, you know quite a while, but oh, it's just two weeks ago. But uh, you know, uh, so, business. But yeah. yeah. So I speak Yiddish, and which is a Germanic language, and so I have no problem communicating with people. But they they ask. They say, you know, what they ask if I'm Swiss. They ask if I'm. Sometimes they ask if I'm Dutch. Uh, you know, yeah. they they're they're. Just, just confused fit. about you know, but but you know, thirty years ago when I first traveled in Germany as as a kid, I did speak Yiddish, and it was very uh, very clear that older people knew exactly what I was speaking, and I could see the reactions, and it was it was mm. it was pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, I felt you know, in a way, it felt empowering, you know, to be able to speak Yiddish in Germany, you know, in the late twentieth century. It was you know. How often does that happen? Yeah. That's what I'd wondered. If there's a sense of, uh, yeah, I've got some issues with traveling. Again, I guess for, you know, not even work work, but the fact that it's integrally tied into to what you're doing. Uh, that said, do you do you have horribly anti-Semitic stories from any of the the places you visit or do they not, tend to be on good behavior when not you're Not really. Uh, no. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what they're – if, if they're saying behind your back, behind my back. Um, but uh, as a Jew, we just assume that's the case. That's, I don't know. You know. It's you know, fortunately, I don't look Jewish. No, that's a joke. I get that too. <laughs> I, no, no, I, I'm kidding. It's a joke. It's yeah. It's, yeah. I, I, what, what, you know, one of the funny things is I, I used to teach a class. Um, well, I was going to go with a cross between Getty Lee and Chip Kid. No <laughs> right, offense, right. but those it's, are both good yeah, books. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no, Getty Lee, I get a lot. That's yeah. Uh, yeah the that's, Chip Kid, I'm only getting because of the glasses and the, the, right, the right. jaw. I don't know if you've ever seen him in person, but. Uh, I'll get you a picture. At some okay, point, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, <laughs> it's funny, but uh, you know, one of the funny things is I I used to teach a class at Rutgers uh, called the Jewish Graphic Novel, and the first couple classes uh, was all about the history of Jews and visual uh, visual graphics. So I would show a huge number of anti-Semitic caricatures, and on more than one occasion, students would say, "Hey, you know." Not cool. These guys kind of look like you. Yeah. And it was, uh, I said, you know, there's always a kernel of truth in caricature. That's the nature of the, the nature of the beast. Yeah. Yeah. I had that question. I did a panel with the, uh, the Goethe Institute a couple of years ago with the guy who did a, a book, uh, a novel about Hitler just waking up in present day Berlin and... Oh, but there's a movie made about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, and they're they're making a, they're doing a franchise now. Like like Mussolini wakes up in in Italy, etc. Um, the problem was when I I did the panel uh, going into it, I thought the author was Jewish. Ah, uh, okay. Turns out he wasn't, and that created a new level of. So is it okay for a Gentile to make these jokes about Hitler? Right. It's okay for a Jew to do it because obviously we have Mel Brooks on our side. Right. But. Well, in-group humor is always, in, you know, for the in-group, you know, when, yeah. when an outsider does it. And, and, you know, obviously it depends on the context. It depends on who it is. It depends on what they know. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, you uh, you don't want out-group 
yeah. people making those inward you jokes. Know, it's just us. We can right. do these things. Right. And, and, you know. Well, that's you know that's something you know something I've said about the Yiddish press before. The Yiddish press is uh, a lot like a private conversation. Mm-hmm. You could say anything because it's very limited. You know, Reading. I mean, there, there were, you know, there were in a lot of cases Gentiles who did speak Yiddish because of their jobs. You know, mm-hmm. if they worked in Jewish neighborhoods or if they worked with Yiddish speaking Jews, they invariably learned the language, uh, but they couldn't read it. Yeah. So the Yiddish press becomes this this place where, you know, Jews can really talk about anything in, in ways that uh, you, you wouldn't hear them talk in public. Mm-hmm. And those people probably wouldn't be buying Yiddish newspapers even if they were capable it's not something that you know oh, i've really got to find out what's going well, on and, you, you know. never know yeah. it's uh, <laughs> yeah. so beyond how you got started in yiddish how'd you get started in comics uh comics i and i'm assuming superheroes leading on to no to, actually really? it's, it's really it's really okay. not superheroes i my mom was a local journalist she did a lot of like local human interest stories uh in the suburbs of detroit and as a result we had subscriptions to four daily newspapers. Not all the time, but often three mm-hmm. to four daily newspapers. And when I would come to breakfast in the morning, the entire kitchen table would be covered with newspapers. And when I was a little kid, my interest was reading the comics. And I was kind of an obsessive reader. I used to like to read, you know, it started. It really started out with cereal boxes. When I first learned to read, I had to read every single word on the cereal box on mm-hmm. every side. It was this weird OCD thing. And that eventually made its way to the comics pages. So I would read all the comics. Uh, you know, some of the comics I really lo- – I remember loving Dondi as a little kid. Uh, you know, that was that was one of, you know, one of the ones I really liked. Uh, and this was just something, you know, it was just part of daily life. It wasn't something – I didn't save them. I didn't, you know, cut them out. I didn't save them. It was just something I did every day at breakfast. I read the comics. Uh, when I was a kid at, let's say, summer camp – I uh, I read comics. Every, you know, parents sent their kids comics. There were some kids who were really into superhero comics. I had friends in school who were really into superhero comics. Other kids read Archie's, Richie Rich's, you know, just sort of standard, uh, you know, throwaway stuff. Uh, I was never that obsessed with this kind of material. You know, my mom would buy it for me occasionally. I um, was into Mad Magazine probably around the age of nine, ten. Uh, so that became an interest. I was also interested in the – I think the first magazine I ever had a subscription to was uh, Famous Monsters of Filmland. Hence the Drew Friedman connection. Right. So go on. Yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> you know, that th- – those were those were my interests. And so I um, – uh, when I was 13 for my bar mitzvah, one of my grandmothers bought me the uh, – the it's the Blackbeard and William Smithsonian. Oh yeah, the big book of comics. Book of newspaper comics. Yes, yeah. yeah. and I loved this book. I couldn't believe. What I, first of all, I I loved the comics, uh, and what I especially like. I you know there I discovered you know the Popeye comics, and I knew Popeye from you the know, cartoons. TV, yeah, but I you know I didn't know that there were, you know that it had been a strip. I mean, it's obviously like I'm 13. You know, I don't know anything. I'm just discovering no these internet. things. Yeah, yeah, and you know there's. Uh, you know, Crazy Cat, I, you know, found incredible. Uh, but there are all these other cartoons, Little Nemo, all these things in those bo- in that book I found absolutely amazing. And it was also what interested me was that uh, it was not just that um, these, you know, old cartoons were, were so interesting and funny and artistically creative, but uh, that these guys had this idea, oh, we can make this gigantic book of cartoons and kind of show what different eras were like in this field. I, you know, I found that so intriguing. And what's what's funny is I still have this book, but it's so dog-eared. The whole the, oh, spot, yeah. the spine <laughs> is broken, and and you know the the, the their rip pages. Yeah. But I can't throw it away, and because it, it was it, the the touchstone for you. Really, it really was. It was it it it's an amazing amazing collection. Yeah. Uh, and from that time on, I guess I when I was in high school, I started to get interested in the undergrounds, and I began buying, um, you know. I first saw them. There was a free magazine, kind of like uh, the New York Press. It was called I want to say it was Metro Detroit, Detroit Metro. I can't remember the title. So they had um, uh, a variety of different, you know, strips in it that were, you know, cut like underground. They had Zippy the Pinhead and and you know other things like that. And I I really liked those. So I began buying, you know, the the printed comics. I began buying Crumb uh, when Raw came out. I think I was, I don't know, 
11th or 12th grade, something like that. I was completely blown away by this. I was really, you know, really impressed. And I remember re pestering. There was one bookstore in town that had it. And I remember going back like every month, like thinking it was like a monthly. Yeah, it's got to come out regularly you know, like a comic. I, right. Yeah. And, and I would go back to this guy who worked in the bookstore. I'd be like, you know, when is, when is the next Raw coming out? And this guy had no idea. <laughs> he, and he, he I, I really nudged him to no end. I, he, I think he wound up hating me. Um, but I was really amazed by this. Like, I'd never seen anything like this. And it, it uh, you know, it was really, you know, this sort of sparked my interest in much more underground work. And I, you know, from that time on, I just began buying, you know, what I could find. And uh, when I ended up going to Europe, I, I, I spent a year in France after college and discovered there where there was this whole huge world of, you know, bande yeah. dessinée of these, you know, these graphic novels that everybody read. And it was, a, it had whole stores full of them. And, the, you know, the, the sort of big department store of records and books, the FNAC had like a whole huge section of this material. And I was, you know, I, you know, once I learned French, I just bought tons of this material as well. It was really, uh, you know, just opened up my eyes to this universe of, of, of comics and cartoons and, and, you know, graphic novels. Did you get to uh, thank Spiegelman or any of the, the, the big influences on you? I mean, yeah, you know what? I've met a lot of, I mean, I've met art at a yeah. very, you know, I haven't spoken to him extensively, but uh, really better than the, the, the cartoonist I met first was Ben Catcher. And what's weird is I met him at a bar mitzvah. <laughs> That's nothing weird about that at all, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> but yeah, go. On. It, it, it was actually it's 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 somewhat embarrassing. I I was seated next to him at a bar mitzvah, and I you said, "Who is this man who looks fifty but sounds eighty? I don't understand." <laughs> well, the thing is, is I didn't let him talk. I was in grad school at the time. Oh, uh, so you knew everything? And yeah. no, no, it wasn't that I knew everything, oh. but I um, I sat down next to him. You know, we introduced uh, our, ourselves, and he said, "What do you do?" And I said, well, "I'm in grad school. I'm, you know, writing a master's thesis." And he asked what I was writing on, and I was writing on uh, two artists and cartoonists who were active in the Yiddish press. These guys, the Zuni Maud and Yossel Cutler, and I launched into this sort of 45-minute story. <laughs> <laughs> about these two guys. These guys were are still really incredibly interesting to me. Yeah. I won't bore you with it, but uh, I just, I'll read the dissertation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, launched into this story about Zuni Maud and Yossel Cutler, and Ben seemed genuinely interested. And I didn't stop. And after about forty five minutes, I said, I caught myself, and I said, Oh, listen, I'm really sorry. You know, I've just been babbling. You know what? You know, who are you? You know, what do you do? <laughs> I thought, you know, so uh, he said, my name's Ben and I'm I'm a cartoonist. And I said, wow, that's amazing. You know, what would you have done anything that, that I know? And he said, well, I, I do this uh, Julius Knipple real estate photographer. And I said, oh, my God, you're Ben Catcher. <laughs> this mushroom cloud blows out of your head. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. It was uh, it was amazing. And so I've been friends. I've been friends with him ever since. He's a, he's, he's a great guy. He's really uh, does amazing. Yeah, Ben's amazing the, the, the second cartoonist I met. The first is Gary Panter, um, right. which was... Uh, an oddball, but it ties into Raw story. When I, I was at a licensing fair for one of the trade magazines I used to work at, and um, I was walking around the Javits, seeing all of the the big licensing properties like Universal and Sony and blah, 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 mid-90s. Um, and I went down these little side aisles to see the other properties that were there, and I see Gary Panter, LLC. I was like, holy shit, you're That's Gary funny. Panter. And he's, like, he's looking at me like I'm about to serve him with papers or something. And uh, yeah, we ended up hitting it off and have stayed – in touch since then, but it was just one of the weird, you know, like the comics world shouldn't be interacting with the real world. I don't understand. This right. is, this is you know, like a Borges thing where it just, you know, <laughs> but yeah, I met a, a Ben at an event a couple of years later and, and stayed in touch with him on and off until I started doing the show and that led right. to, you know, meeting him, other people, et cetera. But we should get back to the, the book. Are there stories that didn't make the cut? Are there, is there, oh, there yeah. Bad Rabbi um, too? like a, a bunch of other, wow, I wish I had space for, I, yeah, there's. Um, I mean, it, it wasn't really a space issue, but I like it was. A lot of them are adapted from previous pieces right. you wrote. So, yeah, some are yeah. you know some are expanded from from previous articles, but there it, it wasn't necessarily a space issue, but a time issue. Like I had to just stop what I was doing sure. because there are enough stories to fill multiple volumes. Mm -hmm. It's 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 really endless, and I have sort of mock-ups of uh, future tables of contents that that. I could feasibly do also certain like certain chapters like there's a chapter on um, uh, violence in the Warsaw rabbinical court 
Yes. I, yeah. <laughs> it was one of the great chapters yeah, of the book. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had to cut a bunch of, uh, of examples from, you know, of sort of sample stories from that because it was just too much. And then there's the, um, the last chapter, which is about the Yiddish crime blotter. I, uh, I had could to do a hundred pages. More yes. I, I, I had, I, I, well, one of the weird things is, uh, you know, I talked earlier about how, how I found some of this material. Another way I, I found some of this is, and this is again, you know, the fault of cartoons, uh, in the Friday editions of the Warsaw Yiddish papers, uh, that's where the, that's where you find cartoons. The Friday edition is their sort of big, like we have the big Sunday edition for, because we don't work on Sunday. They don't work on Saturday. So they publish a big fat paper on Saturday so they can, I'm, I'm sorry, on Friday. So, so they, they can, can read, read it on it. Saturday. Yeah. And that was the only edition that they had cartoons in. So when I was sitting at the microfilm reader, I, um, only need to look at the Friday paper. So I would turn the dial from Friday to Friday and skip the whole week because I didn't need to look at the papers in the middle of the week because they had no cartoons. So one day I land on a Thursday and the headline in front of me is something like uh, uh, two wives blazing punches and the cops. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll read this article. It seems interesting. And it turns out to be about this Hasidic guy in Warsaw who falls in love with falls in love with his be- wife's best friend, marries her, sets her up in an apartment outside of town, and shuttles between the two women, telling the first that he's away on business. The neighbors of the first wife figure out what's happened. They tell his brother, who's this fanatically religious person, his brother drags him to the rabbinical court where there's a panel of rabbis waiting, both wives and thirty members of the first wife's family. <laughs> Yeah, they immediately hold proceedings. The rabbis rule that he's got to, he must divorce both women. When it's official, his brother runs over to him, punches him in the face. The thirty members of the first wife's family jump on the second wife, start beating the crap out of her. Uh, the rabbis run out. Uh, the police are called. They arrest everyone and bring them down to the precinct. Uh, so. You know, I sat in front of the microphone reader. Transfixed. And yeah. I'm like, wow, what an amazing story. Mm-hmm. There have to be more like this. So from that time on, instead of scrolling from Friday to Friday, uh, you know, skipping the whole week, I began to scroll very slowly through the week, looking specifically, you know, they had there's kind of a specific crime blotter type page in the in the Yiddish press. It's like the last or the penultimate page of the uh, of the paper. Uh, you know, scanning these headlines for, you know, sort of juicy events, at, at, you know, wherever. And I wound up collecting thousands and thousands of stories I have at home. Like now you can, you can scan these digitally, but this was, at, you know, at this time I, I had to make photocopies. I have thousands of pages, like boxes of this material. I could, I could like spend many, many years, you know, publishing just Yiddish crime blotter material. And was there that sense? I mean, you, you talk about it in the book a little bit, that idea of um, wanting to keep this in the community because if Gentiles knew what Jews right. were up to, Absolutely. you know, all the, the crazy behavior. Right. And, and you know, yeah. obviously this behavior takes place in every community. Right. It's not, you know, it's but not. But we're supposed to be the, well. Right. And yeah. so, but, but when, you, when you're a minority, you want to, you know, you want to keep a, uh, you know, a low profile, yeah. you know, especially when you're an unloved minority. So. You know, there were a, there are a number of instances where uh, these stories get out of control, and invariably the Yiddish press begins to write. Well, you know, the Polish press is already writing about this, or in New York, you know, the, the you know the American press is already, or the you know the English language yeah, press is on the story is you know has heard about this, and it it becomes a huge embarrassment. And so, you know, when this happens, they they try to you know. Uh, mediate in some way between, you know, whatever, who, whatever parties are involved, they try to, they, they try to calm it down. Uh, you know, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't, but, uh, you know, that's just the nature of, of life. You know, sometimes these stories get out of hand and, uh, it's, you know, for the reader, it's just, it's just, you know, pure enjoyment. And the number of them that, and with the rabbinical ones where the rabbis have to sneak out the side, right, I remember yeah, you make that point that, you know, they, they got kind of embarrassed about having to put that in again and again. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, that was embarrassing. <laughs> you know, the, ra- you know, the rabbis are, you know, perceived to be communal leaders and, uh, you know, they're, you know, they're running out, you know, they're not taking the, you know, they're not taking control of the situation, you know, but how could they, you know, yeah. they're, they're, they're dealing with kind of the lowest echelon of, of, of humanity here. Riotous Jews. Right. Yeah. So what did your mom make of it? Uh, so far she likes it. Uh, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't gotten any complaints. Uh, although I'm sure I will. 
come on. <laughs> it's a Jewish mother. Yeah, no, right. no complaints, I know. please. I know. Uh, because unlike the, the the previous guest I recorded with today, um, we're driven by anxiety, right? Generally. Yeah. 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 I mean, I explained to Walter Kern once when I said I don't have any real addictions. He said, you just haven't found the right drug yet. And I realized a day later, I'm like, you know, anxiety is my drug. Right. And that, that's, that's, uh... that's a good form of productivity. If it doesn't paralyze you, right? Right. No, absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, for I think for comedians, that's the main form of uh, productivity. I would assume. You know, and, I, I assume cartoonists as well. Yeah. As Jews, we're, you know, inherently performing, I guess, just try to, to keep protective coloration up and, and make sure they don't realize who we really are. Um, <laughs> you know, but, there's, also, there's also the aspect of, you know, your, your first rite of passage is, uh, you know, they put you in front of an audience and make you perform in a foreign language. Yeah. You know, that's not easy. Yeah. I did mine in Israel uh, at, at, at the wall. Uh, the funny thing was, we're talking about my bar mitzvah, not my bris. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, we had to get a minion. Most of my family is in Israel. So uh, we get there. There's five bar mitzvah men. Uh, we have to get another bar mitzvah boy and, and, you know, get a minion together. We find one, get together. Um, I turn to the kid. You know, I'm a kid also. Where are you from? Um Fairlawn, New Jersey, basically 10 miles away from where oh, I'm from funny. in New Jersey. And that's the one guy, like a couple of beacons of just, you know, New Jersey Jews, you know, <laughs> bonding together. So uh, was there a, a figure you most wish you knew the end of the story of? Because a lot of these stories of Bad Rabbi, you, you never find out because once they, once the, the, the main thing has happened, the person disappears and you don't know. Right. That's true. You know, um, was there anyone you, my God, I really wish I knew what happened to this person. That's, after. you know, I would like to know. I mean, there are a lot of them like that. But I would like to know what happened to Miss Judea. Uh, you know, that was an instance of uh, – and once these stories are done, these people disappear from the press. Also, she got married. Her name changed. Uh, and, it, and I did find someone who was a cousin of hers who lived in Israel and it was uh, an elderly woman. And one of the things I asked her was, you know, what happened to Sophia Oldak? And the woman said to me, well, I don't – I can't remember. I think she either went to Australia or to Treblinka. And I said, you know, there's a huge yeah. difference. <laughs> a massive, massive thing. Yeah. And she said, well, you know, I just, I can't remember. And so I, you know, did what research I could and I, I never really found the answer to, uh, mm -hmm. to that. Jewish graphic novel. You mentioned teaching it besides mouse. What's on the oh, curriculum? there are a million of them. Yeah. Um, well, what do you use as a curriculum? Uh, wow. I mean, it's been years since I taught it, but, oh, okay. uh, you know, there's Ben Catcher, there are all the Israelis, um, you know, there are, uh, you know, Rutu Modan and, um, yeah. the act as tragic as guys, although I'm probably dating myself when I, I yeah, yeah, you know, the, the Hanukkah brothers, um, uh, there's, I even used, um, ghost world. There are like moments in that. Uh, I mean, not a lot, but it's, yeah. um, you know, it was sort of like a Jews without Jews yeah. uh, thing. Uh, there's, uh, uh, obviously, there's Eisner. Uh, there's um, there, uh, there's Joe, Joe Kubert uh, did stuff. There are a couple of things that are less well-known. Um, there was a guy, and I can't remember his name, so this is going to be pointless, but uh, there's a guy who wrote, a graphic novel about some Jewish gangster that was sort of like an invented. Fa I can't. Yeah, you know what? I can, actually, I can look it up if it's uh, if it's worthwhile. All right. The main books were Will Eisner, Sarah Glidden, Rutu Modan, uh, Harvey Pekar, uh, Jean Svar, Spiegelman, Ben Catcher. Um, like I said, there were, there was uh, Joe Kubert. Actually, there's a really interesting phenomenon of. Uh, Ultra orthodox graphic novels. And nothing about that. where, yeah, where they, where they, you know, they're, um, uh, they do sort of famous Jewish figures. Like there's an, uh, there's a graphic novel on Rashi, and there's a graphic novel on Maimonides, and there's this graphic novel on Shmuel Hanagi, this this you know, Spanish, you know, Jewish Jewish uh, figure. Good artwork to them, or is it basically like the Jack Chick of Jews? No, no, it's it's it's. I feel like the art is done on the cheap is somewhere in Eastern Europe. It's, it's okay. It's, you know what it's like? It's like Prince Valiant style art. Yeah. That's, you know, it's sort of the stock style. So thinking of a sequel or 
is there a is it even worth asking next project that uh um i am thinking of a sequel uh i you know it's weird in a way i don't want to do the same thing twice yeah uh, I, you know i sort of i have to see what the response is you know mm-hmm. it may be that no one will buy this book um you know i'm hoping that someone does someone besides my mother uh although I about I, one so I, that's I, that's <laughs> you know I'll give it out to, to I have a, a Gentile friend who will absolutely plots over this. Okay, uh, great. We're connecting for Thanksgiving, so I was going to give him a copy. So right, yeah. right thanks. So yeah, yeah, so I don't know, you know, I don't know what you know how much more interest there will be in this, but uh, and you know, feasibly, I could come up with other, some other format that will be more appealing. Someone actually suggested that these stories would would be great in graphic novel form. So the idea of collaborating with a graphic novelist. Um, to not get paid for some other book. Yeah, would be, again, would be, as you can get in the lower and lower paying world, <laughs> that's, that's really something to aspire to. Right, I know, I know, I know. So, I put lowering the bar since 1971, <laughs> that's been my, my goal. <laughs> <laughs> but I was also thinking in terms of, um, uh, not reality TV, but the, you know, the, the, the fake documentary style for, for this sort of thing. Uh, like, you know, like on true TV, except, right. you know, obviously... Jew TV, uh, we could oh, do that's, that's that could be a whole network. I'm saying, you know, we, we could we could launch this and you know again find a way to lose even more money and and you know <laughs> violate our ethnic stereotype, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> but good luck with it. Yeah, I enjoy the living you. hell out of it, and um, because I. Right. I mean, basically, it's, it's, uh, yeah. it's Jews you don't expect. Right. And I, I had a lot of those in my, my upbringing. So, you know, seeing how you know, that whole culture existed before we became, you know, quite the, uh, the stereotype of brainy geeks. Right. Exactly. It's, which we live up to. But, yeah. you know, yeah. to a certain degree. But, you know, the reality is, is that, uh, you know, Jews are not all that smart. Yeah. They, they, you know, maybe they think they are, but uh, there are a lot of dummies in our, in our past. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this, this book you know, lets you in on some of them. Much appreciated. Eddie Portnoy, thanks so much for coming on the show. All right. Thanks, Kelly. And that was Eddie Portnoy. His new book is Bad Rabbi and Other Strange but True Tales from the Yiddish Press, published by Stanford University. It is, as I said, a goddamn hoot. It would make a great Hanukkah present, in fact, so order it now from your favorite bookstore. Now, Eddie doesn't have his own site, near as I can tell, but he's on Twitter as Eddie Portnoy, uh, with the handle of Jaime Town. That's E-D-D-Y-P-O-R-T-N-O-Y. So Eddie is E-D-D-Y instead of E-D-D-I-E. He's also on Facebook, if that's your thing. Now, once we wrapped up the main session, I asked Eddie, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear his answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The newest episode of that went up about three weeks ago. It's got extra material from guests like Howard Chaikin, Joyce Farmer, Ben Schwartz, Ellen Forney, Matt Ruff, Patty Farmer, Sven Burkertz, Gordon Van Gelder, Ellen Datlow, Kathy Bidas, John Clute, Mimi Pond, and Matt Worker, all about who they're reading lately. You can get access by supporting the show at patreon.com slash vmspod or at paypal.me slash vmspod. There are all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode. I've got to scan this year's notes and, and put those up soon, uh, plus a series of ebooks that maybe I'll get around to launching and more. So go to patreon.com slash VMS pod and support the art of fine conversation. I recorded the segment with Eddie at his office at Yevo in Manhattan. It was part of a two podcast day. The other one was with Seymour Quast, which will go up in a few weeks. Um, so it was 10 bucks or so at the GW, actually probably 12 bucks because it was a peak drive in, uh, six bucks for subway fare, 30 bucks for parking, but $5 for coffee too. So if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, and coffee, uh, or if you just want to toss me some money because you think the show is worth it and you're glad I'm out here doing this, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. Make a one-time or recurring donation. The special thanks go out to Kevin Katila, John Wendler, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Stephen Nadler, 
Wallace Wilde Minozzi, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Garrett Zecker, Craig P. Steffen, Jack Les Camella, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving weekend, and thanks so much for listening. If all goes according to plan, which means we haven't recorded it yet, uh, we'll be back next week with Vanda Kreft, author of the new book, The Man Who Made the Movies, The Meteoric Rise and Tragic Fall of William Fox. And that's a really good book. Until next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store or at soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to iTunes, look us up, and leave a rating and review for us. That'll help build a bigger audience. Till next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs>